What are the rational proofs of prophecy? Are the miracles of the prophets the strongest proofs of their prophethood? Well, they're, they're, they're temporal miracles, and then there's miracles that stay with us. One of the greatest miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu is the Sahaba. Because if you just study the lives of the Sahaba, how do you get all those people at the same time in one place, men and women, some of the most extraordinary people that ever lived. I mean, Omar ibn al-Khattab, in the hundred most uh, influential people in human history, uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab is in there according to, my, the Prophet Sallallahu according to the historian Michael Hart, was number one. And he was Jewish historian, I think he was being very fair. But he puts Omar in there also as one of the most influential. I mean, how, how, how is that possible? Omar is a, is a product of prophetic molding. Uh, so the transformation of, you know, the alchemical transformation of lead to gold that occurs amongst the companions of the Prophet, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, from a tribe of really brigands, and just becomes so upright that he can't even live with people anymore. I mean, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Or, or somebody like Aisha. Aisha, Aisha had the Prophet Sallallahu I mean, we can't even imagine it, but you know, had the Prophet Sallallahu never come, who is Aisha? Aisha, nobody would ever know a name like Aisha bint Abi Bakr, and yet she's one of the most important women in human history. And she's influenced countless people, men and women. So she's amazing. So, I mean, the greatest miracle, according to our tradition, is the Quran itself. But to understand that miracle takes a considerable amount of time to really, to, to penetrate its mysteries and, 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 and get, I mean, to penetrate some of its mysteries and get a glimpse of it. It takes a long time. But the more you study, the more miraculous it becomes. That's undeniable. But one of the great miracles of the Qur'an is the fact that the ajam can memorize it without knowing what it means. وَلَقَدْ يَصَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهْمِ مُدَّكْرِ And we made this book easy to remember. And you, you, you see people that memorize it perfectly. And then another miracle of the Qur'an is tajweed. Because why is it that people, I've met um, Pakistanis that can't speak Arabic with except with an accent, and yet they can recite the Qur'an with perfect tajweed. It's amazing. I mean, how is it that people can learn? And then, and then also, how, how is it? We don't know how the Torah was originally recited at the time of Moses. We don't know how the Greek of the New Testament was recited. And I, I had two years of Greek, and I, my, my, the Greek teacher told us on more than one occasion, you know, we think it was pronounced this way, we don't know. So even the Greek, Koine Greek of the New Testament is, is we don't have a tajweed of it, like uh, orthoepy, I think they call it. So, so, so tajweed is a miracle of, of Islam. And, and then uh, the Prophet Sallallahu like where do you get the Taj Mahal and the, the Alhambra Palace? I mean, how is it that beauty Western beauty of Islam, Spain, when they show brochures to visit Spain, they show the Alhambra Palace. That was built by Muslims, it wasn't built by Christians. And when they show Hindus, when they show their tourist things to visit <laughs> India, they show a Muslim mosque. And then the Jews, when they show their brochures to visit Israel, they show a mosque that Muslims built. Like how is the, why, why, what's so amazing about, because it's, what civilization created those? Like what, what was in the souls of those people that that came out of them? Early on too, I mean, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, that's very early. And I was once, I heard a lecture on Al-Quds, you know, because, I mean, even though we know Masjid Al-Aqsa is actually another part of the, the, the mount. But uh, the Bayt al-Maqdis, you know, where, where the prophets had the Isra and the Mi'raj. Um, rather, it was the Isra was to it, and then the Mi'raj was from it. But um, 
so I, I heard this, uh, this uh, amazing architect in Colorado, and he was a student of Keith Critchlow, who's a famous sacred geometrician that studied Islamic art. And uh, he was explaining how this is almost a perfect building. Um, there's only one problem architecturally. There's not an intermediary. Um, because if you look at most buildings, they would have a little, between the dome and the base, there would be an intermediary. So that's like heaven and earth, and then you have an intermediary. So when he finished the lecture, I went up to him and I said, you know, I think you're, you're totally wrong about that. He said, what? He said, well, I'm just, I mean, architecturally, we would see that as a flaw uh, in the structure because that intermediary base wasn't there. I said, but that mosque symbolizes a man who went to heaven and had no intermediary because even Jibril had to leave him. And so it's actually perfect if you want to. <laughs> it's the meeting of heaven and earth. So he was like, that's a very interesting point. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that, you know, that's, I think those are miracles of, of uh, our prophet. And Delayan and Nabuwa was very important. But another miracle is all of his his incredible statements about the end of time, incredible, I, I say incredible, but they're credible for us. We believe them. They might be incredible for other people because incredible means unbelievable, but we believe them. But I'm using it hyperbically. So anyway, the Prophet told us, who, 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 who told the Prophet that the buildings in Mecca would reach the tips of the mountains? Like who could have imagined that in the seventh century, to have skyscrapers that reached the tips of the mountains? Who, could have, who told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, um, that uh, the, the mountains of Mecca would have tunnels? Either bu'ijat kadha'im wa Mecca I mean, it's in a hadith. When, when the, the mountains of, 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 of Mecca, when, when, when the base is drilled open, bu'ijat means to like pierce, right? So who, who told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that? Um, who told the Prophet ﷺ that women would wear spandex at, towards the latter days? Because they didn't understand that hadith kasiyat and ariyat, dressed and undressed at the same time. We understand that, unfortunately, right? I mean, we understand that. But who, who would have understood that in the seventh century Arabia? Read the tafsir, they didn't understand it. They're like, how could you be dressed and naked at the same time? So they said things like, kasiyat fi dunya, ariyat fil akhirah. Everybody's ariyat fil akhirah on the day of judgment. We now know what that means. The Prophet ﷺ said that people would walk in marketplaces, badiyat wal afkhad, with their thighs bare. Civilized people never do that. So that. Primitive people don't create marketplaces. Primitive people barter. You know, they live in, in, they don't have marketplaces. That's the difference between civilized, one of the differences between civilized and, so he's talking about people in Aswak, in malls, walking with shorts on. Who, who told the Prophet Sallallahu I mean, there's so many things that he said. Who told him that destitute Bedouin would be vying with one another to build tall buildings in the Arabian desert? Who told him that all this money would come to the Arabian Peninsula? Who told him that the Arabian Peninsula would, would be turned into gardens and have green? All, I mean, it was desert. Like, now you go and you can see these amazing gardens. I mean, they actually have skiing in, in Dubai. Like, they have snow. <laughs> So all these things, I mean, the Prophet he told all these things, and I'm just like, you read the signs of the end of time, and you're like, it's not like Nostradamus, you know, where it has to be interpreted. These are like clear signs. I mean, the Prophet said that children, he said, like rain would be acidic. Qaid means to burn. Who told him about acid rain? And then who told him, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about, I mean, we know, I'm just saying rhetorically, you know, that the, these, for us, these are all signs. He said, ghayda, the child would be filled with rage. Children would be filled with rage. It's amazing. And he said, He said that the, the, the low people would be everywhere. And he said noble people would diminish. They would just begin to disappear. He said, how will you be when you're amongst the leftovers of humanity, like the party's over? It's all the crumbs and the scraps. 
I mean, just look at how people dress. Look how people, people have always dressed nobly throughout human history. Nobody ever dressed like modern people. Nobody in history. Romans had togas. You know, the Persians had their robes. You know, the, uh, all, all these people. I mean, even native peoples had their feathers and their, because they knew they had some sense of what human beings are. Now people walking out, they walk around in, they pay hundreds of dollars for rags. They pay hundreds of dollars for rags. But what's happened to human beings that this is their state? I mean, you have to marvel at the leftovers. It's just amazing. But there were, t there were days, I mean, look, there were days when heroes walked the earth. Like now, they, they, they want it. Every hero, they just have to tear down. Everybody of any distinction, they have to tear them down. They have to destroy them. They have to expose them, show how they're just like everybody else. There's nothing special about them. You know, this is a sickness of people. It's all this leveling. And, 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 and you know, there were great people. And I, I've sat with sanctified souls. I know it. I've, I've been in their company. I've been in their presence. I've felt their hal. You know, so these are real. They're real. And, and the awliya are real. The people of Allah are real. And the lovers of the Prophet said, um, they know what they have and they know what they have in their hearts. And, and the people that don't have that, they, they don't know. But Abu Hanifa said, if kings knew what we had, they would send their armies to take it from us. You know, so I mean, I've I feel sorry for people that don't have that. I really do. And the, the Quran says, some of them wish they could believe like you believe. So don't realize what you have is precious. Don't squander it. And then people say, you know, I'm, uh, I'm having a hard time with my faith. What? Like, what? have you read history? Like people used to get sawed in half. Christians were eaten by the lions. <laughs> you know, I mean, like what kind of faith do you have that like you lost your job and suddenly you don't believe in God? You know, or your child got sick. Who, who gave you the child in the first place? Like, where did it come from? Who, and how do you know what's good for you and what's bad? How do you know if that child it's better they leave the world now than stay in the world? You don't know. Who are you to decide these things? All these things, we're people of submission. Our religion, we don't challenge God. We're not people who wrestle with God. You know, Musara'at, we don't know. We, 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 we surrender, Allah Akbar, I give up. You know, like, don't shoot. <laughs> and, and, it's, and, and it's because Allah wants good for us. It's like, it's sweet surrender. It's not bitter surrender. It's not like I lose. It's you win by surrendering. This is like the opposite of surrendering in dunya. In dunya, you lose when you surrender. In our religion, you win when you surrender.